All right. Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to our Transnational Education in Vietnam webinar, uh, Opportunities for Queensland Education Organisations, which is being organised by Trade and Investment Queensland in partnership with Sunam S4 and Study Queensland. My name is Marnie Watson and I am Sunam S4's Managing Director for Australia New Zealand and I'm coming to you today from a very wet Sydney. I'd firstly like to acknowledge and pay my respects to the elders, ancestors and family of the Gadigal people from the Eora Nation, which is where I'm coming to you from. I've previously spent 11 years of my career based in, in Vietnam, so I'm really delighted we have this opportunity to share some insights with you today. I'm being joined today by Mr. Tom Calder, who is Queensland Trade and Investment Commissioner for ASEAN, and Tom's joining us from Singapore. And we've also got Mr. Heike Manning, who is Sunam S4's Executive Director for Southeast Asia and former New Zealand Ambassador to Vietnam. Heike is coming to us from Vietnam, where he's been based for the last nine years. Tom's going to begin our webinar today um, talking about an overview of the Queensland government's approach to Vietnam. And then Heike will pick up from there to provide some context on transnational education in Vietnam. So looking at models and the regulation and the market situation. He'll also address, opportuni will address opportunities and challenges for each of our education segments. So for higher education, vocational education, K-12 and English language colleges. We'll ensure there is at least 10 minutes at the end uh, for questions and answers. Um, so really please encourage you throughout the presentations, um, please pop your questions into the chat box. Um, I'll keep monitoring those uh, and we'll make sure they get answered. Over to you, Tom, thank you. Thanks, Marnie. Uh, and thanks to Santa Mess 4 for partnering with us to deliver this session today. Much appreciated. Um, I feel slightly inadequate talking about Vietnam given the 20 years combined experience between Marnie and Heike, but I think you understand why we've got them on the call. The, the insights will be fantastic. Been a bit of a challenging time living in Singapore. Uh, I've been here for three and a half years now with TIQ. Uh, we started off okay in relation to COVID, but we fell on a bit of a heap in the last month. So that's really disrupted a lot of our, our work in the region particularly in, in regards to Vietnam and, and engaging out of Singapore. You still actually can't book a flight from Singapore to Vietnam. They, they just aren't running. So that's a bit of a challenge. Uh, so it's great to be able to, to engage with Santa Mess 4 and, and particularly Hiker on the ground in, in Ho Chi Minh to get some timely updates as we move into hopefully what's a, a bit more of a, a COVID normal world for us. Um, we are starting to see some green shoots, particularly out of Singapore, which is which is probably the worst performer at the moment, to be honest. We're, we're really still tightly controlled and, and tightly uh, under the under the cosh here. But it is normalising slowly. Um, they've just announced easier travel lanes between Malaysia and, and Singapore, so that's great. That's a key market for us as Queensland providers and an education space and a sector. So fantastic to see that happening. Thailand's going to take a little bit longer. They're still having a few issues, albeit that they're little sandboxes that they've tried to run are there but not overly successful uh, and as I said Vietnam is still is still closed off to us you can actually get in on exemptions but it's it's quite torturous going and then coming back so that might be a, a goal for us out of Singapore and perhaps out of Australia into the new year as that normalizes and changes up. Um, Marnie and Heike are going to talk to the education space a bit more and I guess the topics around t and &E in, in Vietnam and that's really of interest to us out of Singapore, TRQ, and it has been for a while now. Um, but I, I wanted to flag just really to the audience and thanks for joining us today that after a couple of years of begging, borrowing, threatening uh, myself and Amelia, who's also on the call, we finally managed to get approval to put a TRQ office down into Ho Chi Minh. So, that was all travelling quite well until we hit this little thing called COVID uh, and those plans went into hiatus for 18 months. So we're quite excited about that. Uh, the office, Heike was just telling me, looks fantastic. We formally take possession of our TIQ office next month. So that's there ready, waiting to go. We're currently hiring for two roles in Ho Chi Minh initially. One's a, a trade and investment focus and the other one will be a study Queensland focus. And we're hopeful that both of those resources will be operational in January. Uh, we haven't had a study Queensland resource in ASEAN for two years. And again, I think COVID's impacted some of the thinking there. 
but we did push really strongly with the aid of a lot of support and input from the sector to put that study Queensland resource into Ho Chi Minh. I think that just reflects the, the growing links uh, between Queensland and Vietnam and perhaps the, the lack of meaningful development between Queensland and Vietnam in that education space. Uh, and I know there's a lot of great things being done, but we like to think we can leverage it a bit more and leverage the Queensland brand a, a lot more. Uh, so it's quite good timing for us to open up the office, considering we're hopeful that Vietnam will start opening up in the new year. Uh, the office itself is outside of the education piece is really a reflection of Vietnam's growing importance to Queensland. Not many people know that it's now Queensland's big, uh, fifth biggest export market. And I think that's crept up on a lot of people, just as Vietnam as a market has been a bit of a hidden secret in ASEAN and perhaps in the, in the Asian region more broadly. Um, phenomenal growth over the past 10 years and I guess probably normalising from an international business perspective as well. So um, I'll make a plug there for our roles. If you have any candidates amongst your Vietnamese network that you think might be interested in coming to work for, for TIQ, then please do let myself or Amelia know. Uh, we'll send you the job links. We're hoping to get interviews underway in the next couple of weeks. So look, I'll stop there and pass back to Marnie um, so we can start digging into the, the topic at hand. But just wanted to say that we really appreciate you joining the call today. We really look forward to working with you all in developing Vietnam as a, a great market for Queensland, um, a, a growing market for Vietnamese students coming to Queensland. Uh, and we're hopeful that we can build that up over the next 10 years into something quite special. Thanks, Marnie. Over to you. Wonderful, Tom. Thank you so much. And um, just to reiterate your acknowledgement of Amelia Chan as well from Trade and Investment Queensland. Um, Amelia, I know you're on the line. A, a very big thank you for all the coordination you've put into organising this for us. I'm going to actually pass directly to Heike. Um, and so Heike, over to you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Marnie. I should stop checking my phone. <laughs> um, uh, good afternoon, uh, everyone. Uh, good morning from Ho Chi Minh City. It's uh, great to be with you today um, to share some insights on transnational education uh, in, uh, in Vietnam. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to run you through a presentation and let me just find it here. Um, and uh, let me just pull that up quickly. Uh, I think everyone can see that. Um, and I'm going, to, uh, I'm going to cover off a few, a few sections. And the first couple are, are really sort of general ones, sort of setting the context for, uh, for Vietnam, um, what's interesting about Vietnam, uh, how Vietnam is changing, uh, and why we think that Vietnam remains uh, super strong um, fundamentally for uh, the international education sector um, in the future. We'll then touch on uh, T&E and, &E and uh, as, as Marnie mentioned, some of those key trends, models, regulations that we're seeing, uh, opportunities for Queensland providers, uh, and then we'll highlight a couple of initiatives that SANAM uh, S4 is uh, running here in Vietnam and uh, in Malaysia as well, actually, in relation to uh, T&E as well. First, uh, I wanted to start with a question, and this relates, I guess, to, uh, to um, the questions of perception around Vietnam. And uh, I wanted to ask you all to put in the chat box um, what you see as what you believe would be Vietnam's number one export uh, item in 2020. Um, and um, uh, don't Google, um, just guess, and uh, we'll see what people come back with. Um, I'm just trying to find the, the chat box here. I'm keeping an eye on it for you, Heike. I'll let you know what comes in. <laughs> okay. Um, so please, um, there's, there's no penalties. Um, there's just um, uh, amazing um, uh, reward and recognition for um, <laughs> your answers. And we've got, right, we've got Joanna, su <laughs> Joanna suggesting rice, agriculture, clothing, Samsung phones, electrical digital devices, technology, textiles. Oh, you're on to it, Heiko. I won't repeat them. You got yeah, it. Yeah, I can see it now. Thank you. Uh, clothes. Okay. A few more. Can um, a few other suggestions? Education. We wish. <laughs> okay. Um, so actually, uh, uh, a couple of you had it right. Um, Vietnam's number one export item in, uh, in 2020 was uh, mobile phones. And... Um, Vietnam actually exported around 50 billion US dollars worth of mobile phones in 2020. 
Uh, and um, actually that accounts for around two thirds of Samsung's global production now for, um, for their smartphones. And the reason why I mention that is because uh, this country is changing super quick. And, um, and I think that's what makes it so interesting in terms of uh, looking at those macro trends and what it means for education. Um, so if you, again, if we look at some of those kind of key trends and changing perceptions, uh, it really has emerged as a, uh, as a, a key manufacturing hub um, and an important part of um, many governments and, um, and companies trying to plus one strategies. Um, uh, Vietnam's super connected in terms of FTAs uh, and in uh, global supply chains, as we've just seen with Samsung as well. Uh, but they're not resting on this idea of, okay, we can produce sort of lower end manufacturing um, uh, services and agriculture. There's a real focus here by the government and by others, uh, by industry on moving through to technology innovation and high value services. Uh, and uh, combined with uh, rapidly improving English language levels, um, it's really drawing a lot of attention now, political attention from um, many countries from around the world, uh, not least Australia. And uh, actually your foreign minister is, is here uh, as we speak. Um, and uh, uh, we've seen the UK and many others come through in recent times. So there's a lot of attention here. Um, and also just to mention uh, the COVID situation, which we can't really avoid. Um, so it's been really interesting here. We were in lockdown in Ho Chi Minh City for about four months, which was pretty brutal, to be honest. Um, but uh, in the last month or so, we've reopened. And what we've also seen is just from a standing start, um, a massive acceleration in vaccination rates here. Um, so now we're up around 85% first dose across uh, 100 million people. Um, in Vietnam. Uh, and so what that means is borders reopen is, um, you know, students and everyone else will be double vaxxed and in many cases double vaxxed with uh, Pfizer or other internationally recognized vaccines. Sorry, I'm just having some challenges here. Okay. Um, moving on to some of those key growth drivers, like what is, what is underpinning uh, Vietnam's um, prospects uh, for international education. Uh, the first one is economic and, um, you know, Vietnam's really been a star performer uh, over the past 25 years in terms of its, its global growth. And um, you'll see on the right hand side here, uh, this is a graph from PwC, which is pre-COVID admittedly, but Vietnam is also projected to be the fastest growing mid to large economy through to uh, 2050. So the economic fundamentals are really, really strong. And when you combine that with some of the other um, uh, key drivers, such as demographics, uh, it, it, gets a, it gets really, really compelling. Um, you can see here, there are two things that are going on here with the demographics in Vietnam. The first one is you're seeing, um, uh, you know, a large cohort of um, school age kids coming through, um, through the system. So more than 20 million children um, in the five to 19 bracket uh, by 2025. But you're also seeing alongside that a decrease in um, household, um, uh, the family size of, of households. And so what that means is that as incomes increase, we're also going to see increased investment per child uh, in education, uh, which then ties through into the third kind of key driver, which is consumer spending. Um, and here in Vietnam, parents are already very familiar with paying for their education. Uh, and they're, already, well, they're also very much prepared to invest in, in their children's education. They see it as being very, very important. And so if you look on the right-hand side here, you can see that overall in terms of growth, um, Vietnam, obviously much smaller than India and China, but Vietnam rivals those, those large markets in terms of the growth and spending uh, by, by families on education. And the fourth thing to mention in terms of these kind of key drivers is uh, supply side constraints domestically. So Vietnam actually has a pretty good uh, public uh, education system, um, but it still lacks in some respects in terms of quality and capacity. And one example here is that for this year, in terms of spaces available in uh, public universities, um, almost 250,000 students, almost a quarter of a million students will have missed out on a place at university because there's just not space for them. Uh, and so that opens up uh, options for private providers 
uh, for online delivery and also for international provision of education. Moving to T and E and and starting, I guess, with a sort of a bit of set, scene setting for um, with uh, with respect to Australia and Vietnam. Um, I mean, Australia has a really strong uh, position here in Vietnam already in terms of education. Um, and uh, when you look at uh, the, the number of Vietnamese students undertaking TNE study with Australian institutions, it was already ranked, uh, Vietnam was ranked fourth globally in 2018 below uh, Malaysia, Singapore and China, I think. Um, but perhaps more importantly was the survey which was done by the Centre for Higher Education Studies at University of Melbourne, um, which found that uh, Australian higher education providers ranked uh, Vietnam is uh, second only to China as a destination for future offshore T&E. Um, and I suspect uh, given some of the changes in China recently that we've seen, um, there will have been a bit of a shift in terms of that ranking as well. Uh, okay, you know, just while you take pause, sorry to interrupt mm -hmm. you, do you just want to click, you've got a little Google alert top right of your corner, just... Um, ah, okay, thank you. Sorry to interrupt. I can't believe you guys can see that. It's terrible. Okay, <laughs> thanks. <laughs> um, just let me know if anything else pops up, um, that would be good. Uh, so in terms of uh, Australia as a market leader, as I mentioned, uh, it's already got a very strong education brand here. Um, and in terms of uh, t and &E, uh, you've got some really iconic names, uh, not least RMIT here. Um, but also you have other providers like Swinburne, which has really been progressing very, very well in recent years with its um, opening of campuses here in, uh, in Vietnam, uh, Swinburne, Vietnam. Um, you've got TVET leaders such as Chisholm, which has been running, uh, pioneering uh, d delivery of Australian qualifications and vocational colleges here. Uh, and you also have uh, the increasing delivery of Australian high school diplomas uh, uh, in Vietnamese schools, including VCE, um, South Australia and uh, Western Australian qualifications. Um, in terms of uh, looking at sort of the trends and what's shaping uh, the t and landscape here, um, just to start on the left-hand side of this, of this uh, graph here, um, I, I've, I guess I look at it from the point of view of what are the sort of the key challenges that Vietnam and the Vietnamese government are trying to address here. Uh, and there are three kind of big challenges that they're, they're trying to deal with. One is the quality of education available. The second one is accessibility and addressing that point I mentioned before about um, students not being able to get access to education. And the third one is uh, sort of narrowing the skills gap and making sure that education is fit for labor market needs. And so some of the, the trends or responses we're seeing from the Vietnamese government and, and uh, players here is a real focus on internationalization. Uh, secondly, um, a commitment to digitization and that precedes COVID. Um, these, these initiatives were already underway uh, two or three years ago. And also a recognition that the, the government can't do everything itself and greater willingness to allow private providers to come in and provide some of the solutions. So in terms of impacts, what this has meant is we've seen changes to the regulatory environment, which I'll talk about shortly in terms of t and &E. Uh, we've seen a growth in uh, the TNE market segment here in Vietnam, particularly for 100% uh, in-country delivery. And we're also seeing a growing openness to on on online and hybrid learning solutions uh, for both by government, but also by consumers as well. In terms of some of those delivery models, and um, I recognize that this is, this is sort of primarily focused on higher education uh, at the moment, I'll come to uh, some of the other sectors um, shortly. Uh, there are kind of, just to break it down, uh, there are the sort of the two main sort of buckets of delivery. You've got independent delivery through branch campus or uh, online delivery at distance. Um, and both of those are sort of um, have their challenges at the moment, um, particularly around branch campuses, which I'll talk about in a minute. Uh, and then you have the collaborative type programs, which are um, much more popular um, and uh, particularly joint programs which are delivered in different types of formats, whether it's um, your traditional um, twinning programs, your two plus twos, um, but increasingly also franchise uh, delivery and also micro campus uh, model where you have a deeper strategic partnership with a local university to deliver multiple uh, programs um, uh, with your local partner. And then the other one, uh, just to mention, 
which sometimes falls within t and &E and sometimes doesn't, is articulation and credit transfer, which is also quite popular here. Uh, in terms of joint programs, um, this is the most popular form of, of t and &E model still in Vietnam. And you can see here that um, around two thirds of the programs that are delivered are delivered in that business uh, and economic space. But we are seeing a growth in science and technology and STEM type uh, related joint programs. Um, and you can also see of the 400 plus programs that have already been approved here in Vietnam, around 70% are delivered at bachelor, uh, at bachelor level and around 70% of the student volume is, is also uh, at that bachelor level. Uh, the number there in terms of uh, students doing t and &E programs in Vietnam, um, 37,500, that is from, uh, from uh, the Ministry of Education uh, data, um, but we, we, we need to dig into that further to really understand uh, just, just how accurate that is. But one thing I can say is that certainly since 2019, the number will have only increased. Uh, with Australia, uh, you can see here that um, there are about 17 uh, Australian universities delivering joint programs here in Vietnam across 37 programs uh, and uh, at least three uh, Queensland universities, UQ, Griffith and USQ, uh, delivering their programs here, joint programs here. Uh, if I've missed any, um, then I, I, I sincerely apologise for any um, Queensland institutions that haven't, I haven't captured here. Uh, just briefly on the regulatory framework, and there's a huge amount of detail here, um, which uh, would take a long time to go through, but really just to highlight for t and &E, and in particular for higher education and for K-12, there are kind of three main regulations that you need to be aware of. Um, the first one is Decree 86, and that's kind of the overarching and key uh, piece of regulation around um, joint programs, branch campus setup, and so forth. Uh, the second one is Circular 38, which is a really interesting one. And that is the one that um, determines how joint programs can be delivered now in online and blend, blended format. And uh, just to say that now uh, the Vietnamese government allows for bachelor joint programs to be delivered in up to 100% uh, online blended format. The third one is Decree AR13, which is, uh, as of a few weeks ago, was still in draft. Uh, and that's around recognition of foreign qualifications, including those delivered through uh, joint programs. Um, I wouldn't worry too much about this one at the moment. It's really just to note that it's there and uh, that it does become relevant if uh, a student is intending to study further in Vietnam or to work for the government. For the private sector, it doesn't really matter so much. So the key points really, I guess, in terms of that regulatory framework is we are seeing a move towards a more permissive framework for T&E. Um, as I mentioned, you can uh, now deliver uh, joint programs through online and blended format, which gives um, a lot of interesting possibilities. Uh, on the other hand, branch campuses remain um, very difficult to set up, and I think the RMIT will probably remain a, a, a unicorn here in Vietnam, unless there's another university that has $25, $30 million uh, to invest um, upfront in a, in a, a bricks and mortar campus. So just coming to the key opportunities for higher education providers, uh, first of all. Um, so there are three that I wanted to highlight today. The first one is, um, I think there's gonna be um, considerable growth in 100% uh, in-country delivery of T&E, um, whether through some of these different types of models I described, uh, whether through micro campus models, working with a, a, a deep strategic partnership with a local partner, uh, franchise on a program by program basis, um, or a, a joint program, but delivered in a four plus zero type model. Uh, the second one is gonna be um, that online blended delivery option. Um, and we're not necessarily talking about full delivery uh, online here, but potential, potentially pathway, uh, partial delivery of, of programs, whether at pathway or postgraduate, where I can see a lot of possibilities, or even in terms of delivery of some of those professional qualifications. And the third one to mention is, as we um, see a real push from the Vietnamese government and institutions to improve their research and innovation capabilities, um, I think um, now's the time to be looking at opportunities to build research relationships with um, Vietnamese universities, including through joint PhD programs. 
Uh, and that links really nicely through to the flagship um, scholarship program that the Vietnamese government is, is uh, rolling out at the moment, uh, which will train more than 5,000 Vietnamese lecturers uh, to get their PhD uh, at international university, partner universities uh, offshore in the future. Coming to vocational uh, education, um, to just to mention that uh, it's, it's very much a different system here in Vietnam still. So there's a different regulator uh, and different decrees which govern uh, international cooperation and vocational education. But I just wanted to mention really, there were sort of three kind of opportunities or trends to highlight here. Um, the first one is that, uh, you know, putting aside school leavers for a moment and thinking about, um, about the workforce, there is a huge appetite and demand for upskilling the existing workforce, um, whether it's retraining, upskilling, accreditation, uh, and accrediting of work experience. So I think there's a lot of space in that industry partnerships uh, area for vocational providers in the future. The second one is I think we're gonna see, and this is uh, already in train, a greater concentration of resources into um, a smaller number of um, international colleges here. So there are hundreds of uh, vocational colleges here, um, but we're gonna see, so the emergence of a, a select few which are resourced and are really able to uh, deliver international quality um, uh, programs in that vocational space. And the third one is, I think we're gonna, we're, we're starting to see actually already um, private universities here kind of starting to look at a dual sector kind of model like we see in Australia as well. And this blurring of traditional um, sort of hard lines between vocational and higher education. Um, and if you combine that with the fact that Australia is seen as really as a leader in Tibet and vocational in Vietnam, alongside Japan, Korea, Germany, and uh, the US, um, I think there's a really good base to build from, particularly in some of these sectors that I've mentioned here on the right hand side, um, in terms of healthcare, logistics, tourism and hospitality, which uh, hopefully will come back uh, reasonably soon. Uh, and some of these other sectors as well. Uh, it's not easy um, and it hasn't been easy for a long time, which is why we haven't seen an explosion uh, in this uh, area yet. Um, there are those cultural biases that remain and also price sensitivities, but I really do think that vocational is, is one sector to, to watch and to focus on. In terms of K to 12, uh, the, the big trend here is really that growth in private and bilingual schools in Vietnam. So we're not talking international schools, we're talking schools that are offering um, education to Vietnamese students. And uh, the real trend here is around um, the integration or the inclusion of um, uh, international high school diplomas that are delivered alongside uh, the Vietnamese curriculum. And the reason why that's interesting is uh, it offers uh, fast track for students that are looking to uh, potentially go offshore and study offshore eventually. Uh, and it also offers optionality. So for families that may ultimately decide not to send their kids offshore for study, uh, they have the Vietnamese high school diploma to fall back on as well. So we are seeing increased um, number of high school diplomas being delivered here, including from Australian providers. Uh, but just to say that there is a lot of competition and the Brits in particular are are quite aggressive in promoting uh, Cambridge as a, a good solution for uh, Vietnamese schools. English language, I uh, just wanted to comment here and say that I think, um, you know, there's been just such a, uh, there's been such a growth sector in Vietnam in recent years, um, mm -hmm. and it's led to a certain commoditization of uh, English language provision. So uh, you can see here that there are more than 1250 uh, English language centers just in Ho Chi Minh City. Um, rapid expansion of some big companies here and provision essentially of um, education, um, English education services, uh, you know, across the spectrum from very, very low price point to high quality bespoke type services. So I think for English language providers, it's really about looking for those um, solutions that can offer a differentiated product from what's already available in the market where you're not competing uh, on, on price necessarily. Um, where you can offer something, you know, very much English plus uh, with essential skills um, or where what you're offering can really accelerate that pathway for students that are looking to, uh, to study offshore. Um, and the other point just to mention is for any edtech providers um, that are on the call today, 
um, you know, I think the market's really crying out for solutions that can really drive that scale and delivery um, and support uh, large networks of centres such as English language centres and other um, centres, uh, education centres that are springing up here in, in Vietnam. Just to touch briefly before I finish up on a couple of SANIM uh, t &E initiatives that we have uh, uh, running here in Vietnam. The first one is we're running a Southeast Asia showcase and Mani, I don't know whether you're gonna cover this off, but I'll just cover it uh, briefly now. We're running a Southeast Asia showcase um, uh, at the beginning of December as part of our global gateway partnership. Uh, and what that really is about is it, it's about supporting our international clients, um, universities from Australia and elsewhere to connect to local partners and look at um, potential uh, collaboration. And what we do through this program and through the partnership program, the GGP, is we not only support uh, institutions to uh, connect and potentially identify good partners, but then downstream we can also support with the setting up of agreements uh, and potentially also in the operationalization of t &E programs once they've been set up uh, in Vietnam. And the second one uh, to highlight is we have set up here in Vietnam, uh, in Ho Chi Minh City, a study hub or an online learning center. Uh, and that was set up really in response to, to COVID as a way of firstly supporting students that wanted to get started with their international study but couldn't transfer yet to, to go offshore. Um, but equally important to help institutions to protect their student pipeline uh, while borders were shut. And the study hubs or the online learning center here in, in, in Ho Chi Minh City really tries to address some of those kind of key pain points um, that students face with study online by providing them with a, a good quality space where they can come and study, where they can connect with other students and network, uh, and also where they can get some face-to-face -face general support for their studies to complement what they're learning online through their, uh, through their provider. And we'll be running this through uh, through 2022 as well. We already have forward commitments through 2022 uh, and we'd love to welcome uh, Queensland providers uh, to join uh, and to have our student, their students uh, join us at the, at the online learning centers here in Ho Chi Minh City. Um, and we see this also as potentially um, the first step towards uh, a different kind of option that uh, institutions may wish to offer in future for their students. So where students may choose to start their studies online here in Vietnam before transferring when they're ready uh, to uh, campus study in uh, Australia or in Queensland. So final um, predictions or I guess um, reflections before I hand back to Marnie. Um, I, I really think that that t &E, the adjacent t &E market segment, which is you know, predominantly in-country delivery is gonna continue to grow. Um, it's about these uh, families and, and students or families in particular that may have, let's say, up to $50,000 to invest on an international education for their children, which means they can't get to Australia necessarily for a full um, experience, but they're ready to invest. And that's, that market segment, I think, is going to grow really, really quickly. Secondly, that I think uh, online and blended will be certainly part of the delivery mix and will remain um, after COVID and after borders reopen. The third one is, um, I think now is the time to be thinking about partnerships with Vietnamese institutions because the quality is only going to increase over time. There are huge aspirations here for Vietnamese institutions um, and uh, you know, they want to be um, recognized you know, global institutions in the next 15, 10, 15 years. So working with them now, I think is a really good, a good move. Um, the fourth thing is, I think it's inevitable that we'll see greater internationalization of the vocational sector with uh, huge opportunities for, um, for vocational providers. And the final one, perhaps the most contentious, I guess, of these five is, I think that English language is gonna become a competitive advantage for Vietnam in the future, particularly compared to uh, regional peers. Um, and that's gonna have really important implications for delivery of international education uh, in Vietnam as well, where we're gonna see it delivered more and more in English uh, and potentially the emergence of Vietnam as another uh, regional base for, um, for study for um, students from the region. 
Uh, I'll finish up there and just uh, with a picture on the right hand side, um, for those of you who haven't been to Ho Chi Minh City recently, this is the landmark um, 81, which is one of the tallest buildings in the world, which has been, uh, which just sort of shot up almost overnight. Um, and it's a couple of kilometers down the road from uh, where I'm joining you today, but sort of a symbol of, I think, um, Vietnam's aspiration and its very rapid progress. Um, thanks, and I look forward to, uh, to your questions. Thank you so much, Heike. Uh, fantastic, very much appreciated. And I have to say, if I may, um, to the rest of our Queensland colleagues on the call, um, having someone like Heike, uh, who has that, you know, government link through his ambassador uh, history, combined with that entrepreneurial spirit that Heike brings just creates an incredibly um, valuable level of insight, Heike. So um, very much appreciated. Thank you. Right, colleagues, um, it's over to you now. Um, we're a small group, actually. There's only about, um, excluding the organisers, there's only about 25 of us here. So I'm very comfortable if you'd like to come off mute and actually just talk or over in the chat box. So down the bottom of the screen, if you click on the chat box, uh, just type in a, a question. Um, while we wait for those questions to come in, where have you gone, Heike? Are you still with me? Yeah. No, no, okay, yeah. cool. I'm just checking. While we wait for those questions to come in, um, maybe one from me, Heike, just around uh, just a high level, what you're seeing from competitors. Um, you know, you mentioned the, the British um, context in terms of K-12 school competition, but any, any comments around Canada, US, UK activity uh, in that TNE context? Uh, yeah, thanks, Marnie. So I think uh, we're seeing uh, a lot of activity from the UK. And uh, actually, if you look at the number of programs that have been introduced here at higher education level, um, you'll see that the UK is, is number one. And uh, they have uh, perfected, I think, the art of um, of off the shelf kind of franchise models, which um, as I say, is responding to a, a, a part of the market here quite effectively. So, so the Brits are certainly very active here. Uh, we are starting to see some growing interest from uh, the US as well. Uh, Canada has been a little bit slower off the, off the mark in terms of uh, t and &E, but we are starting to see some, um, some interest from Canadian institutions uh, in New Zealand as well. So um, there are a number of New Zealand institutions that are also uh, actively pursuing uh, t and &E relationships here at the moment. Great, thanks, Heike. Hi, uh, sorry, Marnie, it's Tom here. I just wanted to, to delve a bit deeper on that, Heike. When you, when you talk about the competition and you talk about the opportunities in Vietnam, to, to what extent do you think you need a local partner to help guide you through that, either through a franchise operation or even setting up? It, it, Vietnam seems a trickier market to navigate given the, the language, the culture, and perhaps even the government regulations around that. So where does a local partner fit into all this? Yeah, so um, I, I, well, I think, first of all, Tom, I agree with you. I think that, um, you know, Vietnam is, is super interesting and attractive um, as, a, as a market, both now and in the future. But it's also, uh, it is a complex market. Regulation is complex. Um, you know, setting up and making sure that you you have your duck, your ducks lined up in terms of, um, for example, uh, how you collect fees in a in a T and E relationship, um, uh, whether you need to have a local presence, how you structure your local presence, all of those things require a lot of careful stepping through. So um, you know, there are a range of options. Of course, uh, you know, Sanum uh, is set up to exactly to do that and to support. Uh, institutions, not only in terms of uh, finding the right partners, but also in terms of making sure that they've got them, themselves set up correctly. Uh, and then also working with local institutions. Um, you know, there are some Vietnamese universities uh, that are really, really experienced already in international uh, programs, um, and they've got pretty well oiled machines in terms of uh, supporting uh, the setup of those programs. Um, but yeah, you do need, um, I think, having, you know, sort of a trusted local advisor or people who can support you and just make sure that you're, you're not falling into any traps is, is super important here. Thanks, Mike. Heike, can you see in the chat box, we've got a question from Rick. Do you want me to read it out or you got it? 
Uh, yeah, I can see that. Thanks, Rick. Um, so what's the potential for regulate, regulatory changes to online postgraduate studies recognition? Um, looking at online, online studies for targeting working adults, B2B partnerships, et cetera. Um, yeah, thanks. Um, so right now, Rick, uh, so, I mean, I think the first thing is that, you know, the shift already that was started in 2018 to recognize um, joint programs, um, you know, delivered in online blended format, I think is a really important signpost for where, where Vietnam's moving to. And while they're sort of showing more comfort at the moment in terms of those undergraduate programs, um, you know, allowing up to 100% for masters and PhD, it's still 30%. Um, and so that, that does create some limitations. Um, but, you know, uh, one of the things that's really interesting, um, just look, put, you know, sort of putting the, the regulatory side to, to one side for a moment, if we can, is that, um, you know, in a, in a technical sense, there's nothing stopping you from delivering um, a, an online qualification at distance to uh, Vietnamese students uh, that is not caught by the, the regulations, falls outside the regulations. And then it becomes a question of recognition. And um, we did some, some work, some previous work, um, some survey work, uh, looking at uh, what um, employers felt about, you know, um, postgraduate uh, online study and the extent to which it was important that it had been recognized by the, the government or not. And generally speaking, what we found here was that um, employers didn't really mind that much. They weren't so concerned. So as long as the qualification, even if, if it had been delivered online, as long as it came from a credit, um, a, a reputable international institution, they weren't bothered by it. Um, and so at undergraduate, it's a little bit different, but at postgraduate, I think some of those, um, those formal recognition um, challenges go away. Yeah, if I can just come in there, um, I, I get your point about the open market approach we could take. Uh, that, that then presents a whole lot of commercial risk and uh, B2C challenges, and um, you know, which if, if regulatory constraints got reduced could offer alternative um, lower risk approaches to uh, targeting B2B partnerships, that sort of stuff with postgraduate mm. opportunities for the working adult, that sort of thing. Are, are you talking, Rick, about um, regulatory changes at the Australian end or are you talking about- No, no, in, the, in, in Vietnam. Yeah, right. Yeah, um, well, maybe um, maybe we can, uh, excuse the pun, maybe we can take this offline um, and have sure. a, a, a bit more of a discussion about it. Um, yeah, I'd love to. Because, because there's, there's quite a lot to unpick there. Um, uh, you know, and uh, there is also, you know, there is the potential to, um, you know, work with third party providers to support your postgraduate um, delivery here as well. So you don't necessarily need to uh, enter into a, like a collaborative joint training program in order to deliver your programs here. Um, mm. So that's, that's maybe one thing that we can pick up on um, separately. Sure. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks, Rick. We got a question from Victor um, Hiker around advice for opportunities um, around uh, English programs that create pathways to uh, undergrad and postgrad programs. What kind of models might, might work? Um, types of partnerships? Yeah. Um, thanks. Um, that's a really interesting uh, interesting one. Um, I, I, I would need to. I'd need to think a little bit. A little bit more about that. Um, as I mentioned, uh, you know, I think the, the situation here with English language is evolving quite, quite quickly. Um, and so making sure that you're finding the right sort of space and the right market opening uh, in terms of offering English language here is going to be really important. Um, I mean, potentially you could look at bundling that together, as you say, with um, uh, with an offering, uh, you know, sort of a, a, a more direct pathway program um, or uh, linked to an undergraduate uh, program with, with transfer that follows from that. Um, but again, um, there's a lot of detail here and, and probably the best thing to do is to um, take that offline as well and, and discuss in a little bit more detail sort of the model that you guys operate and what you have in mind. And a question, Heike, around um, location opportunities. So we know, obviously, Ho Chi Minh City and Hanoi, the biggest uh, cities, a lot of competition. 
where else would you put in there other than, you know, we've got Da Nang, obviously, what would you suggest for other locations for institutions to be looking? I think it really depends on, um, on what, what you're looking for. So, um, you know, uh, generally speaking, the, the institutions with the most experience in terms of T&E are still based in Ho Chi Minh City and, and Hanoi. There are a few uh, in Da Nang and Hue in the central part of, of uh, Vietnam, and then also in the Mekong Delta around Kan Thu, there are a couple of others as well. Um, but, uh, you know, many of those uh, sort of secondary centres are coming up quite quickly. Um, there are others like Haiphong, which is the coastal uh, or port city um, in the north of Vietnam, um, which uh, has rapidly rising incomes. Um, but there are, there are sort of trade-offs there in terms of um, uh, traditional issues around visas for people from um, uh, that, part of, uh, that part of Vietnam. Um, so I think, yeah, there's a, there's a sort of a second tier of cities that are coming through, which are certainly worth looking at uh, in, the, in the medium term. Um, right now, Ho Chi Minh City and Hanoi sort of remain the focus, even though uh, it is already pretty competitive in those, in those two cities. Thanks, Heike. Um, Michelle's uh, noticed the point you've made around being a price sensitive market, which everyone would be aware of. Um, what's your thoughts around the student perception, parent perception of online pricing versus in person? <laughs> Yeah, I, I think uh, I think that's probably one that um, people have grappled with um, universally across all markets um, uh, in recent times. Um, I, my sense is, well, I mean, the first thing just uh, I think on, on price sensitivity is um, sometimes I do think um, there is a, an element of mythology to that. Um, so uh, often the price sensitivity is not necessarily that um, parents can't afford to send their families, uh, their students, their children to offshore study. Um, it may often be around they're looking for some sort of um, some sort of signal from the institution in the form of a what we call a scholarship, um, a fee discount, something that they can then wave around to their family and friends and say, "Hey, uh, little Johnny or little Nguyen got a um, got a scholarship to um, to to study overseas." So. So I think there is a little bit of mythology around that. But in terms of your question around online versus in person, I think um, there probably still is some, um, some pressure and some expectation that, that online would be uh, uh, you know, a little bit cheaper. And what we have seen in the market is we have seen some, um, some providers provide sort of, um, how would you say, temporary discounts for students that are, uh, that are starting online. Um, but I do think that will change as well. And um, I think that ultimately it comes down to the student experience uh, as well. And as long as you're delivering a high quality program, uh, engaging student learning uh, in terms of your online delivery, I don't see any reason long term why you should be um, uh, reducing your fees. Yeah, if I can reiterate that as well, just using my own experience last year, I was working for a pathway provider um, and that pathway provider continued to offer some scholarship discounts that we'd always offered, um, but there was no online link to reducing uh, pricing and enrolments ended up finished the year 2020 8% down year on year. 8%, not 50%, whatever else. So I just found that a really interesting little case study of sticking by your guns with the, with the pricing um, for, for the online provision. Uh, do we have other questions from colleagues? Um, while we just see if anyone else would like to ask anything, I just, I thought I'd throw into the information mix as well. Um, Heike mentioned um, UK as being a, a particularly key competitor in the transnational education uh, market. We are, we're actually, Hiker and myself, we're doing another seminar on Friday afternoon at 4 p.m. Sydney time, 3 p.m. Brisbane time. Uh, and that will have a speaker, of, a colleague of ours from the UK, um, Pete, who's just um, come to Southern Miss 4 from Coventry, where he was responsible for 45 T&E partnerships globally. Um, so he's got a lot of personal insight into uh, managing T&E partnerships, creating T&E partnerships. So a slightly different angle today, very much focused on Vietnam and the realities of the market. Friday, a little bit more generic around transnational education and a UK uh, competitor to us and, and how they've been successfully doing that over the last five to, to seven years. 
I think if there's no more questions, um, please feel free to come off mute and stop me before I wrap us up because that's what I'm about to do. Um, if there's no more questions, um, could I just reiterate my thanks to Trade and Investment Queensland, um, Tom uh, and Amelia, thank you both so much for your, your partnership on this. Um, Heike, thank you for all of your insights. And uh, to our Queensland colleagues, it's really lovely to have this opportunity to have a chat this afternoon. We are recording this uh, seminar, so I'll make sure that the link to the recording is shared with you over the next 24 hours. Uh, may come to you through Amelia from Trade and Investment Queensland um, rather than from us. Um, we look forward to talking to you more in the future and thank you all. Bye-bye. Thanks everyone, bye.